Per favore prendete posto, spegnete i cellulari. Please take your seat and uh, shut off your mobiles. Um, we are going to start uh, in, in time because we have also the streaming. So we want to be... Okay. We were waiting for the Congress President and... Uh, Per favore prendete posto e spegnete i cellulari. Please sit down, take your seat and sh shut off your mobile. We are going to start uh, in a few seconds. We want to be on time. Please take your seat. Please take your seat and make silence, uh, also to your mobile, please. Welcome everybody. This is the first plenary lecture of the INQUA Congress in Rome 2023. The first lecture will be by Carlo Doglioni, professor of geodynamics at the Sapienza University of Rome since 1997 after having worked in the universities of Ferrara, Bari, Potenza in Italy. He visited several international universities such as Basel, Oxford, Rice, Houston, Columbia, Palisades. He was president of the Italian Geological Society. Since 2016, he is president of the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology. His research is mainly on the mechanics, mechanism of plate tectonics controlled by the combination of tidal forces and mantle convection, and the origin of seismicity, studies for which he has received numerous awards. He is a member of the National Academy of Science in Italy, l'Accademia dei Lincei, of the National Academy of Science called uh, the 50, and of the Academy of Europe. And having said that, let me add something personal because uh, this is a very topical moment for me. Uh, I am almost crying. Uh, 
Uh, I met Carlo first in 1988, a few uh, months after being graduated. Uh, we started to fight uh, about the origin of uh, the um, uh, Fucino Basin at the tonic, Quaternic Tectonics. And uh, we, start, we, we continue to fight all over. So I am always right. He is always wrong, but he is the president of the INGV <laughs> and probably the best geologist in the world, in my, at least in my humble opinion. So I am very, very, very pleased and uh, honored. It is an incredible honor for me to introduce uh, Carlo Lecture on uh, Quaternary Earth Gradients. Please. Thanks, Alessandro. Thanks, Francesco, for the invitation. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, the President, Thais. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Well, the um, key word uh, of this talk uh, is uh, gradient. Gradient is uh, any type of uh, variation in space, in time, of uh, a physical parameter, whatever we want to, to discuss, pressure, temperature, electrochemical parameters. And uh, the greater the gradient, the highest the energy which is involved. So let's take a, a look to the major plate boundary. So the three major um, reef zones in the oceans and the three major subduction zones in the world. And if you just uh, link together these, uh, the direction of these uh, plate boundaries, we see that there is a line that is connecting this direction. That's what we called, uh, for the past, uh, let's say, 100 million years, uh, the tectonic equator. What we see in the past uh, is what we see today from uh, GNSS. Uh, network. So what was the past motion of plates is even today, and we recognize even today what we could uh, define as uh, the tectonic equator. But there is a further important ingredient. Let's take the Hawaiian chain, and we see that the, the volcanoes are becoming older and older as we move away. This implies the Colman at the base of the lithosphere. So, this shows that the lithosphere is moving westward relative to the underlying mantle. And the velocity of the Pacific plate is so high that all plates are moving westward when we compute the vectorial sum. Why there is this decoupling? Because between 100 and 200 kilometers depth, in the low velocity zone, the shear waves, B waves, are slower. That's, that's called the, the low velocity layer, which is at the top of the asthenosphere. And this is uh, in that location because at that depth, the thermal gradient uh, is slightly to the right of the mantle solidus. So there is a partial melting, which allows uh, the rolling of olivine crystals uh, within the low velocity zone. So computing the plate velocity, you see this reconstruction of plate motion with the poles uh, in uh, northern North America and in South uh, Indian Ocean. And you see the red dots, which are the earthquakes with magnitude larger than 6.59. So uh, you see the motion of plates is not random, but is uh, mainly along this mainstream. So what is controlling these, these uh, different velocities? Because plate tectonics occur because there are velocity gradients, which are controlled by viscosity gradients. So, Low viscosity beneath the Pacific allows a faster velocity of the Pacific plate relative to the Nazca plate. It's the contrary between the Nazca plate and South America plate. So this uh, polarization of the outer shell of the Earth, the lithosphere, determines that the, um, the mantle is moving in the opposite direction, so it's moving to the east relative to the subduction zone. So west directed subduction zones are steeper relative to the east or northeast directed subduction zones moving along the tectonic equator we have seen before. Now let's take 
a subduction zone in which we have an upper plate and a lower plate. The subduction, there is the subduction hinge, which is extremely important to analyze uh, the kinematics of subduction zones. So in nature, there are two types of subduction zones where the subduction hinge is moving away relative to the upper plate or where the subduction hinge is converging relative to the fixed upper plate. So we can calculate the velocity of the subduction, which is given by the velocity of the subduction hinge minus the convergence velocity. So you see here, for example, the, velocity, the subduction velocity is faster than convergence velocity. Here it is lower than convergence velocity. Here we have the origin of uh, the car basin. Here we have a uh, double verging erosion and strong uplift. So two examples, the Tonga subduction zone, where we have uh, a velocity of subduction of 240 millimeters per year, which means uh, 240 kilometers per million year. It means that uh, during the quaternary, the uh, oceanic lithosphere, the Pacific, uh, reached almost the base of the uh, upper mantle. So it's the fastest velocity in the world. So extremely, extremely high velocity. But in spite of this incredible velocity, we don't have any mountain on top. We have uh, nice islands. And we move in the other side of the Pacific, where in the Andes, uh, we have a convergence of 6.6 uh, uh, centimeters per year. So the subduction is slower because part of the convergence is partitioned in shortening into the Andes and part into the subduction. So here we have a high elevation and the subduction hinge is converging relative to the upper plate. So two different subduction zones like we have here in Italy between the Alps and the Apennines, which are extremely different, high outcrops, uh, large outcrops of basement rocks in the Alps, uh, mostly sedimentary rocks in the Apennines, two vergent uh, or urgent in the Alps, uh, one single vergence in the Apennines, very shallow astenosphere, astenosphere beneath the Apennines. So very different uh, geometry, kinematics, and tectonic evolution and morphology. That's the present morphology in dark green here, but what was eroded in above the Alps or Himalayas or the uh, Andes is much larger than what is eroded along west directed subduction zones. So now we can, uh, with this uh, simple uh, relationship, uh, the uh, subduction calculation, we can compute that the entire volumes which are recycled into the mantle are more than 300 cubic kilometers per year, which means that in 108 million years, we, cons we will consume the entire oceanic uh, lithosphere, which is what we observe, because in fact, we have an age uh, of the oldest oceanic uh, crust in the Pacific around uh, 200 million years. But the subduction velocity is asymmetric. You see that uh, the west directed subduction zones provide much larger volumes than east or northeast directed subduction zones. This implies a compensation of uh, more than 120 cubic kilometers per year of the mantle moving from west to east. This implies that in the quaternary, a 70, 792 million of cubic kilometers in the quaternary have been consumed. So we see that all plate boundaries are moving westward, and this is uh, explained. And the, the, the consequence is this asymmetry that we observe both in subduction zones and in reef zones. Now the question is, what is determining the energy for this motion? We have different uh, models, the ridge push, tidal drag, mantle convection, slap pull, transaction, all different forces, which are gradients. And uh, the most uh, famous one is, of course, uh, mantle convection, which implies uh, a cold uh, lithosphere and a hot uh, uh, lower mantle, determined with a Rayleigh uh, convection number and the radiogenic heat, uh, which should determine the convection into the mantle. However, when we add uh, the mineralogy variations and the increase of iron content, and we consider the interior of uh, the Earth in terms of temperature and pressure, 
we see that there is a problem because most of the mantle is in superadiabatical condition. Only the upper mantle in the shallow asthenosphere is in superadiabatic condition. So the potential temperature suggests that only the upper part of the mantle is in active convection, whereas the lower mantle is mostly in passive mantle convection. So the idea that the slab pool is the major driving force is given by the idea that the asthenosphere is lighter than the overlying lithosphere. But any petrological model shows that the lithosphere is lighter than the underlying asthenosphere. Now, one of the most famous laws in, uh, in uh, geosciences is the Gutenberg-Richter frequency and magnitude relationship of earthquakes. Uh, that shows that uh, there is, uh, let's say, one magnitude 9 every 10 years, one magnitude 8 every year, 10, 15 um, earthquakes of magnitude 7 to 8 every year, and so on, increasing one order of magnitude and, and increasing the frequency. So this law, in a way, suggests that the energy which is providing seismicity is a global phenomenon, because if there is a a sort of tank in which the energy is accumulated is uh, within the entire planet, not in a single subduction zone or in a single convection cell. So it's telling us this law that uh, plate tectonics is uh, a global phenomenon which, is, which needs uh, a global energy. So seismicity is, uh, you know, uh, very rare in the polar regions and uh, we know also that the uh, tidal bulge is misaligned with respect to the gravitational alignment between Earth and Moon because the Earth is not perfectly elastic, so for its unelasticity, it reacts to the Moon tidal force which is with a small, about 12 minutes delay, so the, the excess of mass is misaligned, so the Earth is rotating eastward, but this bulge would like to, to remain on this alignment, so determine a, a, a torque which is oriented westward. And this could be the origin of the westward drift of the lithosphere that we have seen before. And this uh, determines also the slowing down of the Earth of about two milliseconds per year, and the reason why for the conservation of the angular momentum of the receding of the Moon of 38 millimeters per year. So since the origin, since the start of the quaternary, the length of the day has increased about one minute. So every day, this ground is uplifted 30, 40 centimeters, the solid earth tide, and is shaking horizontally about 10, 15 centimeters. But with this torque, which is with this momentum oriented toward the west, the idea is that there is a sort of hysteresis of a few, a few tens of uh, uh, microns every passage of this effect. So in order to check these uh, tidal effects, we measured now, we have a long time series um, of more than 20 years, and we see that there are, with a fast Fourier transform, we see these strong signals of, at about uh, uh, 18 point uh, six years, or there is the year, the um, half year, and also another interesting harmonic at 8.8 .8 years. So, if we look the detail, for example, between Himalaya and Australia, you see that red dots, which are the measurements, are absolutely overlapping the oscillation given by the harmonics, uh, the tidal harmonics. So this uh, tells us uh, that the plate velocity is absolutely well uh, tuned uh, with uh, tidal oscillations, especially with the long-term tidal oscillation, which are the migration uh, of the line of nodes, uh, of the revolution of the Earth, uh, and the apsides. Now, so the, the conclusion of this first part is that w w we can calculate the velocity uh, of plates uh, and the motion of the lithosphere relative to the underlying mantle, assuming a very low viscosity in the asthenosphere, in the low velocity zone, 
And uh, this implies that there is thermal cooling and uh, astronomical tuning. So the system is controlled both by the external forces and internal forces. This means that it's a, a self-organized chaotic system working together. So it's a sort of a small worm that the lithosphere goes up and down twice a day, but it, uh, when it goes down, it moves relatively to the west relative to the underlying mantle. So differently to other planets uh, with much lower viscosity like Jupiter or, uh, in the Earth, uh, we have a very different uh, direction of plate motion, much more undulated. And uh, what is different relative to Jupiter or Uranus or Saturn, for example? We have a strong uh, cyclicity, uh, for, for example, the precession, the obliquity, the eccentricity, but the precession in particular, the, one of the famous Milankovitch cycles. Well, today we have the equator which is here. In 30,000 years, the equator will be here. So the tectonic equator is uh, the bisector of uh, this oscillation. And what is important and very uh, intriguing is that the Maxwell time, the relaxation time, which is the ratio between viscosity and rigidity, is exactly in the order of the precession time. So it means that this undulation implies that the, at this time scale, the lithosphere behaves like a fluid. So we have a symmetry, we have a, a west uh, motion of the lithosphere, which is about 3.6 degrees during the quaternary, and plate tectonics uh, could be explained by the astronomical and internal mantle convection. And the seismicity that we observe is still controlled by the relative motion of what occurs at the, the decoupling layer, which is the basal decolement between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. So what we observe at the surface with brittle features are the effect of something which is deeper in the relationship between lithosphere and asthenosphere. So in Italy, at the INGV, we record about 15,000 earthquakes every year, one every half an hour, more or less. So to, to uh, again uh, demonstrate how the Earth is a living planet and uh, is breathing. So the tectonics of the Apennines is related to the retreat of the subduction slab of the Adriatic, Ionian, and Sicilian lithosphere. And what we observe now is uh, a Beccar basin, the seismicity concentrated in the hanging wall where there is the extension and contraction in the frontal part, which is also constrained and, and confirmed by GPS data showing extension. We are in a cross-section between Rome and the Grand Sasso, let's say, and this is the Adriatic side. This is the reason why we had the recent earthquakes, like the 2016, for example. This is, this is uh, the epicentral area with the two main shocks, uh, which were recorded uh, uh, on, not only by the seismic network, but also the, by the GNSS work. And this is a nice uh, um, paper in which uh, these colleagues uh, Wilkinson and others have shown the co-seismic motion recorded by GPS along the um, Monte Vettore fault. And uh, what is interesting is that the deep of the fault is exactly the uh, horizontal and vertical components of this motion. Now, um, Interferometric data now are very powerful, and what we observe is that the red area, which is the area which co-seismically subsided during the um, October 30, uh, 2016, and what we observe is that the amount of uh, co-seismic subsidence is much larger than the uplifted area behind. So we see that the area which is more than one meter in the depot center is much uh, deeper than the area which was uplifted laterally. This implies that at depth, uh, there must be an area which is absorbing this difference in what is subsided and what is uplifted. We had uh, about 0.1 cubic kilometers of uh, lost surface and only uh, um, 
0.01 uplift uh, of the shoulder. So this implies fractures uh, at depth uh, which allow this uh, collective catastrophic uh, evolution of, and the origin of earthquake, uh, fractures that we know very well in the field. So thousands of fractures that form during the interseismic which are uh, collapsing during the co-seismic stage in a few seconds. Now, everybody knows about the um, Andersonian theory about uh, the deep of the faults uh, and uh, the difference between, let's say, the brittle and ductile part of the, of the crust. And uh, we all use uh, the maximum, minimum, medium uh, principal stresses in order to, to um, describe what is occurring in the crust. But why there is this uh, 30 degrees deep, for example, for a thrust or 60 degrees deep for a normal fault? Now, let's take a thrust, for example, and let's uh, apply the gradient concept. So if we try to calculate uh, mathematically, you see that the, this uh, angle, about 30 degrees, is the one where we have the larger gradient in terms of shear stress between the lower part and the upper part whereas uh, the, the shear stress is uh, practically uh, very low or absent in the vertical plane or no gradient in the horizontal plane. The same occurs for normal faults. So the 60 degrees is the area where is the, uh, in the deep where we have the larger shear stress gradient. So in order to, sort, to make a sort of DNA of deformation and seismicity, we have uh, um, a different behavior between extensional or compressional tectonic settings because here is dominated by gravity, here is dominated by elastic energy. So in, uh, in an extensional settings is mass, uh, gravitational uh, acceleration, the displacement, uh, the friction, and the, inc and the uh, inclination. Whereas uh, for contractional or strike slip tectonic settings is the hook uh, um, law of elasticity. So we have earthquakes, we are moving uh, pro-gravity and earthquakes that are moving against gravity, deformation, and uh, this explains why, for example, normal false earthquakes uh, generate uh, longer and uh, they last uh, longer time air, um, for a, a longer aftershocks for normal faults with respect to thrust tectonics. We have two examples here, um, practically a similar magnitude, but you see the extensional one has a much longer um, sequence of aftershock with respect to the uh, thrust because thrust uh, stop moving because they need energy to move against gravity, whereas in extensional settings you move always in favor of gravity, so you have always energy available. This explains also why the B value of uh, the Gutenberg-Richter law is uh, steeper for normal falls, so lower magnitude, but more earthquakes uh, with respect to thrust, uh, with, which have uh, lower events but higher magnitude uh, of events. Uh, so we, we see a relationship between uh, the Gutenberg value and the Omori P value and uh, showing the larger number of aftershock for normal faults here. So uh, the differential stress which is required in order to generate normal faults or trust is different. Usually we assume that this is related to that uh, breaking a rock under extension requires less energy. But that's not true because uh, beneath the one kilometer depth, uh, all the crust, even in extensional settings, is in compression. So the, the reason why we have uh, different differential stresses is because uh, there are different energies which are determining motion in the angle or on the, the footwall of the uh, faults. So that's why also we have a lower magnitude for normal faults with respect to thrust, because in order to move uh, very long uh, uh, areas and uh, volumes, uh, we need uh, much more energy than moving small blocks of uh, volumes, which are always moving as soon as they can move. 
So you see here three examples of a normal fault, a strike slip uh, or a thrust, uh, for example, from the Alps. Uh, but uh, moving to the Apennines, uh, where we have, uh, for example, the Fucino Basin, which was the area of uh, the 1915 uh, terrible uh, Fucino earthquake, um, we have normal faults uh, and uh, the um, analysis of these uh, intramountain basins, for example, with uh, seismic reflection profiles, allows the, to uh, recognize the quaternary involved in, in these intramountain basins. But, you know, the um, paleoseismology is uh, uh, resulted fundamental to study historical, uh, prehistorical earthquakes. Uh, so when we don't have uh, any catalog for the past, uh, the uh, paleoseismology has become a very powerful tool. This uh, um, uh, seismic gap area, uh, uh, this study is 97, this seismic gap preceded an earthquake that occurred a few years later. So, or even these studies, for example, in Calabria by Paolo Galli and, and other, Paolo Galli and Galadini also studied this fault on the Gran Sasso mountain, which is the highest peak in the, door, in the um, central Apennines. And looking at this, the outcrop of this fault, you see here the normal fault in this position which implies uh, at least uh, 500 or 1,000 earthquakes uh, with uh, a co-seismic motion of one to two meters during the last 1.5 million years. Now again with SAR we have the fingerprint of uh, an earthquake. Uh, the dimension of this uh, epicentral area increases with magnitude. So now we, we know what is occurring within the epicentral area where we have also the largest damages, the highest peak ground acceleration, the peak ground velocities are all concentrated within the area which is uh, uh, subsiding or uplifting during the earthquake. So the vertical component is very relevant uh, in order also to determine the shaking and the amount of horizontal damages on the buildings. So moving outside uh, the epicentral, you see the micro seismic data show that the deformation and the damages are much lower with respect to the epicentral area. So we can define a sort of active volume. The active volume is the, the volume which is really moving during the an, an earthquake where uh, the volume is crossed by the uh, seismic waves radiated by the fault. Outside the central area, the volume is passively crossed by seismic waves. So that's an, uh, the uh, Karaman Malash uh, uh, February 6 earthquake. You will see the car and the red house, how they are uplifting, moving up and down just before the arrival of the shear waves. Then the, uh, the movie stops because the, the um, camera was uh, stuck. So this horizontal, uh, the, this vertical component is very important. And the, uh, the, w what we would like to stress is the importance of the calculation of the volumes, uh, which is constrained by the thermal gradient, which controls the brittle lutei transition, which is a function of the thermal gradient, in fact. Uh, so where, for example, here in Rome, we have a shallow brittle lutei, and the volume which, you, which can be involved by active uh, extension is smaller than moving inside to the Apennines, uh, where the brittle to tight transition is deeper. And the relationship between the thickness and the length of the volume is about uh, three times. So uh, based on the volumes, we can calculate, uh, for example, the uh, maximum uh, potential earthquake that can occur. And this would allow us to have uh, a an inference about the, the shaking that could occur into the epicentral area. Even Rome uh, underwent uh, several earthquakes. So you see here, there are a few of them which are reported here. One is uh, very uh, relevant for the Colosseum because one side of the uh, amphitheater was destroyed by this earthquake. And uh, that's the recent earthquake in, um, in Turkey, which, uh, you know, 
was a real tragedy. 50,000 people died, about 200,000 buildings uh, practically now not more habitable. <laughs> the displacement was uh, between five to eight meters along the two major strikes default that uh, was, were activated. And uh, uh, the Turkish colleagues made uh, excellent uh, analysis of the fault line. You see Chenzi's Hill Dream, for example, ma mapped uh, the entire fault system, even with a thermal uh, camera. Now, you see the pre-earthquake uh, um, SAR data showed that uh, Turkey was moving about uh, two centimeters westward relative to the uh, Arabian plate to the east. And during the earthquake, this area was untied, but this is the volume which was liberated and radiated the energy. So it's not the single fault, but it's a system of faults and a volume and area which allowed the energy accumulated during the interseismic stage. So what is important is we have to focus on what is going on during the earthquake in the epicentral areas, because there we have the highest uh, peak ground acceleration in the 3D volume of the crust, of the upper crust. So if we consider the earthquakes, we have a sort of cascade of gradients which are controlling the seismic radiations, starting from the mantle down to the brittle crust. But we have gradients even for generation of uh, volcanoes, for example. Uh, that's the recent eruption in Stromboli in July and August uh, uh, 2019. And the eruption is uh, just the um, overtaking of the, gra of the pressure gradient within the magas chamber, or a, a, a given amount of fluids and gases which are generating eruptions like the famous uh, Vesuvius eruption of the 79 and Domini. So, uh, associated with, with volcanoes, for example, here in the Volcano Island in the Olian Archipelago, we have uh, recorded this gradient in CO2 flux, uh, which was uh, very dangerous for population and uh, uh, for the INGV um, alarm, the population here was evacuated at least during the night. So we have uh, about 10 uh, air volcanoes for uh, active in, uh, in Italy, and uh, what is uh, relevant is uh, that each volcano has a different story because each volcano has a, dif has a different geochemistry. You see from this diagram of Pecerillo, you recognize that the amount of types of uh, basalt, of uh, volcanic rocks that we can detect in this area, practically the entire spectrum of volcanic rocks. So to testify that the mantle is strongly heterogeneous, but at the global scale, we see something similar to the earthquakes. You see the bay, for example, um, the explosive index, uh, volcanic explosive index, that shows uh, a relationship similar to the gutenberg richter law for earthquakes. So showing that even volcanoes uh, as follow a rule which is uh, similar to the an astronomical control, or at least a global control. Well, you all are aware about the problem of uh, the increase of the CO2 at the global scale. This is a gradient. This is an important increase uh, which is associated to this increase of thermal, of the um, temperature in the, the average temperature at the global scale. You see here, starting from several tens of years ago to the present day to the right. So taking a reference from the average temperature in 51 to 80, now in 22 we have this temperature anomaly, which is far above relative to the 1.5 uh, objective that goal that was assumed in, in Paris and Kyoto uh, agreement. You see, for example, the Antarctic sea ice, which is incredibly fast decreasing this volume, but also the temperature in the oceans, which is increasing. This is an, a very relevant gravel, uh, um, gradient, 
which may affect the conveyor belt, uh, which may increase or decrease the speed of the conveyor belt, the, so uh, affecting, for example, sedimentology and uh, the, the temperature of the lower side of the oceans. So now we are in the quaternary. The quaternary started uh, with the cooling of the uh, atmosphere, and uh, we are approaching a sort of uh, uh, warming of, of, of uh, uh, the atmosphere. So it's, uh, unless uh, it's a spike, isolated spike, this seems uh, to represent the end of the quaternary because uh, it's constrained by two gradients, the cooling and the warming at the end of the ice house of the uh, quaternary. Well, Venice is a sort of paradigm of these problems because the flooding of Venice is constrained by the interaction between the solid earth and the atmosphere, sea level rise and, and ground subsidence. The ground subsidence is associated to the, to the regional monocline generated by the subduction beneath the Apennines. Even if we are in the foreland of the Apennines, the substance of Venice is associated to the Apennines. And we see, for example, here with the Tyrrhenian data by Antonioli, for example, here we recognize the uh, regional monocline which is retreating and generating this uh, uh, area of subsidence controlled, even in the Alps, controlled by the regional monocline of the Apennines. And we see this also in Venice with the bridges uh, which have a, a light which is uh, about uh, uh, 46 uh, centimeters in the last five centuries. So it's about uh, something less than one millimeter per year. But we do have uh, not only substance associated to the subduction, we have the sea level rise associated to the global warming. And uh, this implies uh, large areas uh, uh, which were, will be flooded uh, at the end of this century. And in Venice, for example, the red areas are those which will experience uh, uh, 17 centimeters and uh, flooding in, uh, in, uh, seven, in 80 years from now. So we, uh, we have a very strange uh, relationship with the uh, origin of life on Earth and the uh, thermal um, window in which life is possible is very small with respect to the spectrum of temperature. And life on Earth has been very, very starving for four billion years. It's only at the beginning of the Cambrian that the life exploded on the Earth. But what we know about uh, this evolution? Well, we know that at the beginning we have an indifferentiated planet uh, with uh, uh, heavier elements which were sinking into the core, iron, nickel, for example. But also the uh, solid air core didn't exist until uh, two billion years ago, possibly even, even uh, later for some researcher the solid inner core started only 50, 100 uh, uh, million years ago. So at the same time, we have uh, a decrease of the gra a sort of gradient of the ionizing radiation coming from the sun. So we have a decrease of the um, damaging the radiation of DNA, an increase uh, of uh, the magnetic field, the dipolar magnetic field, which is shielding us from the ionizing radiation. So the inner core started when also the oxygen curve started to rise and the families grow. So starting from the beginning of the Earth, there was, there was no inner core. There was uh, uh, the sinking of heavier material, the cooling of the inner core, the, for the increase of the magnetic field until the present day magnetic field that we know, which is shielding and protecting the planet with the, and, his astino, and his at atmosphere, because it's the atmosphere which is protecting us from the ionizing radiation coming from the sun. Well, we are experiencing an incredible gradient in terms of increase of people on the Earth. Only 200 years ago, we were around 1 billion people. Now we are more than 8 billion. 
So if we look at any outcrop in the field, we know that just a bed, it may represent, for example, a Milan-Jewish cycle, so it may represent really the entire recent history of, of Homo sapiens, and we are experiencing possibly the sixth mass extinction. So again, associated to a, a gradient, a gradient in, in this case, a thermal gradient, uh, we are um, witness of a growth in population of Africa of 73%, whereas Europe is increasing only 11%. So there is a strong gradient in terms of demographic increase which has uh, uh, to be connected with the per capita income, which is very low in Africa and very high or relatively higher in Europe. So these gradients are controlling the migration that we know and we are experiencing today. Now, I think you all are aware about the thousands of exoplanets that uh, we are discovering. Um, and this is a very astonishing and wonderful discovery. However, what, uh, um, what I want to stress is that our community, the geoscience community, is very poorly interested to what is going on in the center of the Earth. I wonder if uh, in the Dante Alighieri, the Divine, divine Comedy, uh, is a sort of uh, witness from what is uh, the perception from the past that, that in the, the sky there is uh, the the heaven, the paradise, whereas in the center of the earth, there is uh, the hell. So we are not interested in the hell, but we are made of atoms coming from the interior of the earth. So I wonder why we are not uh, so able as a community of geosciences to foster the idea that is very important to study the interior of the earth, at least uh, how important it is to study the exoplanets. Because if you look at the investments which are uh, given by any state, uh, any governmental agency, in terms of study of the universe is more than 10 times or 100 times larger with respect to the money that is invested to study the interior of the Earth. So, um, in the hell of uh, Dante Alighieri, you see all the different uh, also, which, and you see the sours of discord, which are very in, deep, in the deep hell of uh, his reconstruction of the inferno. So it's time for a change. So I want to recall what uh, Thais uh, yesterday said in his uh, uh, opening ceremony. Solidarity, I think is important. Uh, it's fundamental for our community, not only from a human point of view, but also among us, because uh, it's time to work together for better understanding of the Earth. Thank you. Grazie Carlo, thank you so much and uh, we start now with the poster session, there is no comment discussion after uh, plenary lectures, we are only listening and thinking about, and uh, lots of thinking today. Have a good uh, poster session and uh, following sessions for today. <laughs>